On March 24, 1989, the oil tanker Exxon Valdez ran aground, tearing open a hole in the ship large enough to allow a record 11 million gallons of oil to pour into the crystal clear waters of the Prince William Sound, Alaska. It covered an area of almost a thousand miles, about the distance from Massachusetts to Florida, and it forever changed the lives of several hundred species of birds and animals. The timing of the spill couldn't have been worse. The sea otters were approaching the height of their birthing season. A precious week of time was lost before it was conceded that a bird rehabilitation facility and an otter rescue center were necessary. After the Valdez facility was forced to close because of disease, another was built across the Sound in Seward. This hospital is a series of trailers, rows of soft, net-sided cages, small pools for two otters called totes, and several larger above-ground pools where as many as six otters could swim. One trailer houses the washing, drying area and the veterinary clinic. Another has a room for intensive care and recovery. A nursery for the motherless pups shares a trailer with a locker room, and another is used for the preparation of the animal's food. More than 1,000 pounds of fish are delivered each night, clams, scallops, crabs, squid, and pollock. The motherless pups brought in from the ocean seem to have a slightly better chance for survival than those born at the center, but their external conditions were worse. One pup was found floating in the sea, her left eye gouged. We named her Precious, and all were covered with some oil. It was presumed the oiled mothers could no longer stay afloat, as the oil mats down their fur, causing them to freeze to death and sink to the bottom of the sea. Those born at the center had already received oil through their mothers before birth and consequently were born with toxic poisoning. This toxic poisoning caused such neural damage that often the mothers would toss their newborns over and allow them to sink to the pool's bottom. We recovered them quickly and brought them into the nursery where they lived in a large waterbed crib. We tube fed them a special formula of liquefied fish and nutrients several times a day. We monitored their vital signs and gave them that most important ingredient, tender loving care. But the little lotters weren't the only babies brought to us. We also took in several baby seals found washed up on the beach, umbilical cords still attached, but no mothers in sight. world, providing care, food, and even teaching them how to swim. Their instinct to nurse is so strong that they followed us everywhere, trying to suckle on our pant legs. When we tried to move, they clearly voiced their disapproval. volunteers and staff, including veterinarians who came from as far away as Australia and New Zealand. Here, a veterinarian from Canada examines a new addition to the center. This is Thelma. A vacationing couple from California found her trying to crawl along the oily beach. We estimated she was only about a week old. She was thoroughly examined and gently nursed back to health. But they weren't all success stories. This is Ice Pick. This pup was about three months old and found abandoned on the beach at Kodiak. Her tests showed extensive liver damage, kidneys, lung, and brain, all symptoms of toxic poisoning. The doctor, a woman from Anchorage, sat up with the pup all night long, but it slipped into a coma and away from us. Outside the nursery was a noisy, hectic hub of activity. The seals followed the same system as the otters. First they were isolated, then they were either tube fed or hand fed when ready for solid foods. Tube feeding the seal sounds awful, but they couldn't take bottles and this was the only way to ensure they ingested enough food. Then they moved to the totes and finally to a release facility. I always felt sorry for you when you were sick, so you're getting better. Lots of revenge in your mind. She was always like a little sickly one. At the other end of the compound, 
Shampooing the oiled otters was in full swing. It takes four people nearly two hours to wash the sedated otter. An experienced handler positions himself at the head to feel for swallowing responses and muscle tensing, a sign that the otter is beginning to come to. And a doctor is nearby to administer more sedative. The otter has about 650,000 hairs per square inch. The outer hair is fine and long. The fur near the skin is thicker and more coarse, and trying to part it to see the skin is very difficult. Otters having almost no fat depend upon the air they can trap in these hairs to keep themselves warm and buoyant. That's why the oil spill killed a vast number of otters. Their fur became matted down, and the more they tried to lick themselves clean, the more they poisoned themselves. These lucky animals are being lovingly cared for, and had the center been built larger, this could have been a daily activity cleaning hundreds of otters. But the numbers of animals we could help was greatly limited by the small size of the facility. When everyone agreed that the otters were clean, they were taken to the drying room, where again, four people with powerful blowers spent another two hours drying the animal. A damp otter could catch a chill, so this is an important step. Again, this work is done by both staff and volunteers. On this particular day, we had an attorney from Chicago, a stockbroker from New York, a student from Anchorage, a tourist from Australia, and a doctor from Tennessee. From here, the otter would be taken to rest in the recovery room. Once stabilized, they were moved into totes where they could naturally restore their fur. Then to larger pools, not dissimilar to those many people have in their backyards. And then a holding pen, the last step before being taken to the release facility at Chapalof Bay. Once back in the water, they had little trouble exhibiting typical otter behavior floating on their backs and using their chests as tables on which to hold their food. A favorite pastime is opening clam shells. In the wild, an otter dives for a clam and a rock. He places the rock on his chest and bangs the clam against it several times until the shell cracks. Then, with his powerful jaws and sharp teeth, sets upon his dinner. A mostly mollusk diet as opposed to their California cousins, who eat sea urchins and abalone. The younger otters might be more interested in a game of catch instead of food, and the youngest ones from the nursery use this time for their swimming lessons. They try swimming on their sides and stomachs, blowing bubbles in the water until they discover it's supposed to be done on their backs. As of August 1989, nearly 1,000 otters were dragged in dead from the oil spill. Estimates are that thousands more sank during the week delay in starting the rescue operation while Exxon pondered its need. Here, the pups sitting on their mother's chests, being protected and cleaned, are only five hours old. We can only hope that the rehabilitated otters do not swim back into the still oil-saturated waters of the Prince William Sound and its environs. Given what we now know about the 15-year-old single-hulled oil tankers still cruising the seas, we sadly expect that this can happen again. An oil company official admitted that most tankers in use today are showing signs of structural stress, and to date, there are no new oil tankers being built anywhere in the United States. And we can only hope that the new life born here will give further healthy life to generations of animals to come and to eventually replace the more than 30,000 dead birds, the bald eagle among them, killed by the oil spill. But the process will be slow. The already endangered sea otter has only one pup a year. And the natural mortality rate remains high until they reach the age of three. As Nan Eagleson, president of the Prince William Sound Conservation Alliance said, our survival depends upon nature's survival, that continuing to reshape the natural world to human needs rather than living in harmony with it cannot but lead to ecological disaster. Working at the Otter Rescue Center was both a spiritual and educational experience for all of us, but one which I hope we need never have again. <laughs>